How about another deadlift video? I am really excited about this one because we got Chris Duffin that's going to work with me today on deadlifts and we're going to find all sorts of tips and tricks and secrets and just really cool things that you guys can use in your own training. And Chris is a mad scientist. I'm going to give you a couple of uh, more videos. Are draw my face? Or? <laughs> uh, plenty of whiteboard space to work with guys and we're just going to kind of go with it. Enjoy. There are time codes in this video if you want to find something in specific. But Write down the first thing that comes to mind when, uh, when the word deadlift is said. It's not a lift. Huh? It's not a lift. It's not a lift. It's like dead lift. Like the name is almost wrong. It's more of a wedge. Oh, it's, this hip, it's this hitch. It's a hip hinge to get in position, but we're, in, we're, we're literally wedging our body between the bar and the floor. Uh -huh. And you're going, well, the bar's down here, but it's, it's connected off the shoulder. So everything's like, here's the force. This is where it's applied. Yeah. We're going to take and wedge our body between those two. So we're literally going to push the floor away and wedge in there. So it's all about creating the tension to effectively wedge. Yeah. And if we're thinking about lifting, you almost get into this poor mechanics uh, you know, type where we're just gonna lift that off the ground. Well, that's, that's cantilevered out there. And mm -hmm. so we wanna think about it as a wedge. So, so we're gonna we've start. got you know, yeah. our goofy self here, we've got our shoulder bar hanging down, and we've got, I'm a horrible draw, draw but you know, there's, a, there's our barbell on the ground but we're literally wedging our hips through. And as we do that, you'll end up in this standing position with the bar hanging down, right? So, yeah. so this, is, this is actually how we're completing that lift. If we create rigidity through, through here, uh -huh. then we're gonna apply our force through the hips. So it's, it's, and we see a lot of people think about lifting with their back and it's really ability to stabilize and manage this, this position through here, so this torso rigidity and be able to manage and control that. If we create no energy leaks in that system right here, there's no lifting other than stabilizing. And boom! Okay. Just like that. So what you're saying is you have a really strong back. You have to have a strong back to be able to, but be able to control it. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna give you a really hard question. You're gonna hate this one because this is like, you're gonna go, oh, you're all over the place with them. You put, you, would you rather put a deadlift on a back day or a leg day? Mm. It depends. Okay. So um, I can do, I can go either way. Okay. So it, yes. So it really depends on your training objectives and how you're employing it. So the whole program scope and what that looks like. Uh -huh. You could do either one of those, and I ha I I I have done both of those. Uh -huh. So it doesn't matter what what we're looking at is this is an axial loaded movement. So the our force vectors are through the spine, right? So all we're doing is we need to manage, this is the, anything that's axial loaded, so this compressive on the spine yeah. is going to have the longest recovery time of any movement. So squatting, deadlifting, and then things that kind of mix in there too. So if we had the same, we're doing a... Uh, we have enough whiteboards, Sam? We do have another one over here. Okay, I think we can... So, so here, uh, I've got doing a good morning. Yeah, yeah you'd, you'd have a slight hinge in the knee, right, uh, here. But we have a force this way, but we've also got a force front to back, okay. right? So this has got a little bit of front to back. This is a, you know, force vectors I'm throwing on here really quick. But we still have a huge axial component. So as a whole, we really want to manage the amount of axial program, you know, that we've got in here. Mm -hmm. Not minimize. So a lot of people take this, oh, that's long to recover from. Let's, let's separate things out. Let's just do leg extensions and other stuff like that. But our capacity to be able to develop, so we want to think about, uh, is develop the, you know, our time from one cycle to the next, to the next training year, to the next decade, is about building our capacity to handle axial loaded vectors, okay. right? So <clears throat> this is actually kind of a, an important discussion because understanding that these are all similar but they're all kind of using the legs as well. Uh -huh. But we could do something like, uh, let's throw in some stuff that people think about as developing work capacity leg, uh, printing, sprinting with a prowler. Okay. So we've so got our prowler in I'll front draw, of us. I hope you draw the sled over here. Yeah, draw the sled. All right, so all right. I'll get the sled. And we got our arms pushing this and our legs, right? We're running with this thing, okay? Which is using our legs, but that force vector is this way, okay. front to back. Or we can do a hip thruster. 
Wait, where, this is the head? Uh, yeah, so bench is under them. Should we got the legs, legs hips. It's our weight. Uh oh, right here. Yeah, yeah. Yep, supporting the. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Something. We've got our weight right here, right? So where's our where's our force vector again? This way. Okay. So now both of these, even though they're they're inverted, one's standing upright, mm -hmm. running this way, one's laying down on a bench. Both are training. This one is doing like uh, glutes, right? Quite quite a bit. We've got glutes here. We've got you know you know basically everything in that chain, but they're not doing anything to develop our axial loading capacity. Okay. So what you're saying is a prowler and a hip thrust with a barbell in your They're going to train bench. the same muscles, but they're not going to help with our capacity to be able to do more, more movements like that. Okay. But a yoke run, stuff like that, those are again going to take from some of those same resources and develop the same capacities. So we want to look at that and make sure that we've got enough of this. Like you don't want to take, hey, I'm training this and then go, well, now I'm going to switch and add a bunch of this in for a period of time. Yeah. And then not be doing this, this capacity is going to drop. Okay. Does that make sense? It does, yeah, yeah, I get it. So when you put it in your program, doesn't really matter. It's really how much do I have in every week in keeping that the same, uh -huh. and then being able to bump it a little bit over time. Damn, Chris, you take up a lot of space on a whiteboard. <laughs> I'm playing a, a 2D platform game like uh, Crash Bandicoot over here. Yeah. I'm about to like, <laughs> you gonna fall <laughs> in the pit over here? <laughs> what do we got? Oh, okay, so this is a, uh, looks like a mm, mesocycle. Yeah, and this could be month, it could be yeah. whatever, so whatever time increment. Four but weeks. Four weeks, yep. And actually, let's do down here. Is that your deload? Yep. All right. Notice it's not nothing. <laughs> a lot yeah, of people like I, to just take time off. This is it's nothing. Deload. This is no. nothing. And there's a reason for this. We're going to use two words that sound bad. We've got acute and chronic. Okay. And we're not talking like Dr. J chronic, okay? Yeah. Although, you know, that might be interesting before training. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Fits the green. Yeah. Okay, so, and that would be, that would be our, 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 our chronic. Another word for average. I got it. Average. So what's our average training volume? So this is a block. Here's what we've got for, and each of these are, we'll think of like a, you know, a bar and a draw. Oh, now we've right. got a nice Excel yeah, yeah. sheet. Now we got a nice Excel sheet, yeah, right? Yeah, this is a graph function. So, so let's say we're looking at our workload yeah. from a, from a axial loaded or deadlift, mm -hmm. or Romanians and good mornings and squatting. What's the total amount of work that we're doing every week? Okay, so acute would actually be the spike. So actually, that was supposed to align with with here. Oh yeah, sure. So, so over time, we wanna we wanna bump these on occasion. So you, but we don't want to have over a 10% spike. So a goal over time is to increase this. And how you increase that is you have some spikes and they're going to bring up your average. But if we go above, and I say 10% because basically about 15% is where we start potentiating the risk for, for injury. Okay. It doesn't mean you're going to get hurt, but typically you'll get like some sort of nagging pain or something about four or five, six weeks post in the future. Okay. Here, if I'd taken this here. Yeah, okay. that's called a chronic pain. That's, that'd be, yeah. <laughs> but, so this is why I said, you gotta be careful about managing that and going, hey, well, let's switch to these other exercises. Yeah. Well, if we switch to those. If you switch to the wrong one, then what happens? I'm down here. Oh, shit. Right? And so what if I've actually taken my average and moved my average down, or if I did my deload, mm -hmm. it's a complete time off, and then it went right back to average again. My average actually goes like this. Uh -huh. And then I spiked well above my 10% because I went, I just took it. I went to Cabo for two weeks yeah. and you come back, I'm going to hit it harder. And this is what people do and go make up for, make up for lost time. Right. Make up for the workouts you missed. Yeah. No. yeah. And then what happens? You end up with a future problem, which then hurts your consistency now okay. because you got this nagging pain, something comes up, it's a couple months down the road and then you take a little more time off and then you can't, you got to work around stuff and so on. And that has the biggest impact on your long-term consistency in the bigger cycle. So let's say so uh, the, the month to month, the year to year. I think right? this is important, like just quick key point for someone uh, who goes on vacation. What should they do when they come back after taking Ease into this, it. Like, ease into it. Okay. So ease they don't be like, I got all this energy. Now I'm going to like hit the gym hard. So ease back into it. Ease back into it. So okay. take it, okay. take a stair step. I just took a bunch of, realized if I took some time off, yeah. I'm going to go here and then here and start bringing that average back up. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yep. And that's also why you don't want to do a complete deload. 
Right. Think of it more of like transitioning from one, take it a little bit easier that week as maybe you're transitioning from one training block to the next training block and transitioning that, yeah. right? Because we don't want to drop, we want to have maybe and get a little bit of recovery. Yeah. But we don't want to drop the drop that average because over time, our goal is to take this and do this. It's to set world records. Exactly. <laughs> New epic shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. All so right. This is good. Like Juju, and you do this. So like you're training for a bodybuilding show right now. Yeah. And you still work in some heavier stuff too from that from that standpoint. So developing, we think about this as quality. So here, this is volume. Right. Volume as it relates to injury rates. But we want to think about the qualities of the exercise that we that we do as well from a periodization standpoint. It's beyond just just those measures, right? right. So being able to maintain uh, mobility is a quality. Yeah. Endurance is a quality. Work capacity is a quality. And strength, is, strength is a quality. Hypertrophy yeah. is a quality, right? So then there's a lot of different, and you can break that down into smaller increments if you want to get really precise about things. But yeah. those are some bigger picture ones. I got you. And, and maintaining is different from gaining. Like it takes a lot less exactly. like volume and intensity to maintain something as it does. I mean, I think uh, changing volume is more forgiving than intensity, in my opinion, if I were to maintain, I don't know, what do you think? Let's say you want to maintain a lift as you focus on something else. You probably want to kind of keep the intensity higher, but just the volume is the first thing I drop. Yes, but then maybe you add in a volume you know, a volume session or a volume couple sets yeah. every few weeks so that you don't lose backward progress on hypertrophy if all you're doing oh, is okay. doubles. I'm, I'm working, I'm trek, prepping for, you know, competition. Mix a little bit of that in there. Or I just developed a ton of metabolic capacity. Yeah. Uh, did a whole cycle of doing, you know, the, this is actually what this is good. So this is great for developing, you know, some of that qualities. Here, this still works. What does it do? Both of these help you jump further, right. sprint, faster, all front to back movements, right? All right. So Even people, though this is laying down. I want to so. say that the people that jumped in the middle of this video and just caught that quick, uh, <laughs> you have no idea what this is. <laughs> this I, I, is like a drawing. So. This is, I mean, when, when, you, when you have no context for what this is, it's like this. <laughs> it's kind of funny to look at, but I understand what you're saying. It's, you know what's fun about this though? is people don't think this is fun. They, they see it as, oh, this is very complicated and they get intimidated by it. But it's actually like, there's it's a- It's really basic. It's very day. basic, but also this is, but there's a lot of room for error actually. Yeah. You know, there's, is, there's as much room for error as there's much room for improvement. You know what yeah. I mean? So let's say you're training for a strength event, right? Yeah. And so you start shifting into lots of heavier weight, singles, doubles, triples, whatever it is as you're prepping for that. But you developed a lot of capacity like in a prior session, maybe doing a lot of sprinting, prowler pushing, whatever it is. You don't have to maintain that at three or four sessions a week of 20, 20 minute high intensity interval yeah. sessions. Like, but a little bit here or there, you can drop it off significantly but and still maintain that. Right. So that it doesn't disappear completely. And then we see a lot of people do that. Well, I'm doing three. And then it's like they come back and you've got no gas, yeah. no ability to uh, you know, to put in a lot of work, and what's that going to affect? That's going to affect the next session where you want to develop some hypertrophy, be able to train, but you just your gas out the volume. Right. You can't handle the volume. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's get. Oh yeah, we're going to deadlift. We're actually yeah, we're gonna, we're going to do some deadlifts. Too. I got sidetracked. I do that, but <laughs> I think this stuff's very important. The because a lot of people just look for like, oh, like this is the tip that's going to fix my deadlift, not realizing that your programming and your whole concept of how it works with everything else you're doing is, you know, yeah. always involved. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's put, always involved. You know? Do you put it on back day or, or, or leg day? It doesn't matter, you could do both. Right. It's a matter of how we're managing that as a whole with it, how it interacts with those. Yeah. Good. I love it, there, just answer the age old question. Do you put deadlift on back day or leg day? That's a short answer. <laughs> this is the answer that it actually gives you something to work with. Some though. context with it. Some context with it. Okay, so I'm deadlifting in the middle of a, uh, Power Center platform for Mike Bartos. This Ooh. is why what this is, just in case you're wondering. But it doesn't matter. So it's going to be the same thing whether I'm lifting on it or off of it. But yeah, I'm just doing some deadlifts. I deadlift. I can do both. But lately, I've been switching to this, so I haven't been doing sumo in a while. Okay, nice. I can do both. Yeah.
you know, we're gonna we're gonna go up and wait a little bit here because we're gonna actually do a real workout after this. So might as well use this as kind of priming for the workout. One thing I want you to show me here in a second, I'm gonna take a short break, is how do I get my hamstrings more involved in this lift if I want to do that? Okay. Feels. Right, so. Okay, we are back. We're back. We did a couple warm up sets. No shrugging, you see that? You see, <laughs> I have a problem with my dad looks like this. Shrug up. Now pull it up your body. Okay. <laughs> now don't shrug the shit this way. Okay. <laughs> I've seen that in your lift. I also see something else. You don't get much hamstrings in your lift. No, I don't. Actually, that's- I can see it right here. Well, that's kind of why I was like, taking you in that direction with this was kind of a selfish reason. I, I want to put deadlifts on uh, leg day sometimes, and I find that, well, it's, really hitting my back a lot, but not my hamstrings. Well, that's because we got to teach you how to stand. Stand up? Yes, got to teach you how to stand up. Okay. So that's the end of the deadlift. And so there's a really common problem that people have with thinking about the movement and lifting it. And so if we change our perception, and our perception will help drive the patterns that we're having. So, uh, and the real common thing I see is people wanting to finish here. Okay. Like this, just like this. You may not be able to see from my mat. My mad science coat here, okay? <laughs> so, Time to strip. Uh, but it's like, hey, I, I got this completed, here I am. Yeah. There's a slight unhinge here, and there's a slight hinge here. You're actually not finished. And if we have that as our vision of where we're finishing, if you're in this position right here, this and this are not firing to their maximum activity during the lift. Yeah. So I have to take my feet, I want to take my feet and root, I want to push the ground away, and I want to stand tall, hard, and then it, here at the top, I'm flexing my quads, my glutes, everything. And just reach, driving through the ground. Boom. Guess what? You're not shrugging here either, right? Right. Notice my head position, nice neutral position. Very rigid, tight. You're doing a great job of managing these mechanics from here to here yeah. and engaging the lat as a spinal stabilizer right off the bat. Those are some big misses that a lot of people have. But the finish, you're finishing right here. Oh. Right here. Yeah. You're finishing right there. Okay, I'm gonna try again. And so I want you, as you step this far, let's stand first. So stand tall and tell your body what you're gonna do. So <clears throat> just stand here, okay? Flex your quad hard. Now, after those quads engage, flex the glute and drive your feet. Imagine pushing those through the ground, okay? That's the finished position. That's the position I want you to end in. Okay. All right? Do I tall start, do I start this? Yeah. Oh, you start all flexed up. Well, I just oh, yeah, I visualize. You don't have. To, yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to be a super active thing, but I want you to think about ending in that position. Boom. There you go. I think Spud had me do that, didn't he? He was like telling me like flex like your glutes all the way through, like keep flexing. Your flexing, finish was flexing. completely different. You were fully locked out. Yeah. And if we're finishing here, this and this are firing. So if you're especially like the strongman style deadlift right here. I'm not arguing how they, how they do that for the competition results, but they're not utilizing these because they're utilizing this to pull it up over the top. Yeah. They're pulling over the top of the hips to get position uh -huh. versus wedging through, which is gonna use more of those resources to drive that. Okay. Cool. That was great, that was a huge difference. That's what you do one. Okay. So it was in the setup. That, it was actually in the mental setup on mental that one. Setup. Okay. But yes, most everything that I like to teach is, is all about the setup. So there's some great things that John is doing that a lot of people miss. So um, they'll come down to the bar, be slack with it, and then they go to lift, and you'll see right before he goes, you'll see this incitement and engagement. So it's not retracting the lats. So other people do that wrong. They think they retract their shoulders and yeah. get down in this position. We don't. We want to engage and pull this so we're actually using, pulling this into a really good stabilized core. So I like, just myself, the way I do my setup, is I like to create tension between here and the floor first. Mm -hmm. And I actually start my wedge to do my setup. Okay. So I actually wedge into my setup to create a massive amount of tension. Uh -huh. And I do this on both the sumo and the conventional. Oh, you do conventional too? Yes. Okay. Um, and it's, the, it's just a really easy, it's not the way to do it. There's, Lots of ways to roam. Yeah. Um, 
So, but it works for me and it's easy to teach in that fashion. Yeah. Uh, because once we have all the tension in the right areas, there's really nothing else that can happen. Yeah. And we know if there's a gap, it's something that you didn't create tension effectively in, and we, we address that. So, <clears throat> and Mike, he hasn't touched a deadlift bar all day. He just, well, this is like the first lift he's done. It, well, actually, well, I did start deadlifting again. I took a, a two and a half year break, and I did a month of deadlifting. Uh -huh. um, so I have about 20 sets now in under my belt for deadlifts in the last two and a half years. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. But wait, then wait, I haven't wait, deadlifted wait. again for three months. I just want you to point that out real quick. Just let me say that again. He knows how many sets he's done. He, he, he's like 20 sets under his belt, you know, in the last what month? Two years. Two and a half years. Two and a half years. But yeah, that would be, that was done about three months ago. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, he knows before. how many sets he's done. That's an interesting way of communicating that, you know? Okay, yeah. yeah. No, most people don't know that. You know, they don't know what they're doing, you know? It's like, oh, yeah. you know, I have like 24 sets, yeah. you know, this month or, you know, within the past two and a half years. That's a really cool way of saying it. Okay. I'm not in a great position, but it's like in the bar. Yeah. And as I do that, now I'm gonna wedge my hips into position. So I'm gonna drive them in. As I pull my spine, I'm gonna inflate my, my, my core against it and just create all this tension. And the deadlift, that setup, should almost break the bar off the ground on its own. So for me, when I deadlifted heavy, I haven't been deadlifting for a long time, okay. it would take about 500 pounds for me to be able to set up on a bar. Because otherwise, the bar would be a couple inches off the ground uh -huh. when I go to lift. And if I didn't, I would be compromising. I'd be getting down in this position, which is not where I start to deadlift. It'd actually be a different exercise. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to ingrain that pattern. Okay. So I think about, me not letting the bar own me, where I'm gonna go and meet the bar, versus me owning the bar, saying this is the position I'm gonna get into, and you're gonna bend to that position to meet me, <laughs> and then I'll start the deadlift. That's some savage shit, dude. What? <laughs> <laughs> I used to shit. I used to do some savage deadlifts. <laughs> That's what you're gonna do if you're gonna do 881 pound deadlifts every single day for week, you know, a couple weeks straight. <clears throat> But I'm not like that anymore. I'm just an old man that, that spews shit. So, you're really at. Did you see how my the, the bar bends to my setup? Yeah. I'm creating so much tension. I'm Shoot. gonna own that. Okay. We try. We try. I'll try to do it his way. Well. I'm, I'm not. Try to, I try to uh, copy you, see if I can do the same style. All right. Am I anything like Switching that? Switching styles. Yeah. Uh, you're starting in the bottom position, you are creating really good tension, yeah. but you're actually lacking some tension in the areas that you want to be training. Okay. Yeah, there you go, think about that. Good. Boom. Squeeze all the way through at the top of this last one. There it is. Oh, good. Did you feel the difference on that last one a little bit? Yeah, I felt it in my groin, actually. Okay, <laughs> adductors will start coming in a lot more. Yeah. You know? and not so, in a bad way. Yeah. I, just, I was like, okay, I feel my groin is activating. So it's like we're getting the balance of everything. Everybody wants to think about like isolating muscles out. And it's not like, okay, we have to do our glute activation drills. It's like, well, yeah, the glute and the adductors work together to balance the hip function. If that isn't optimized, we're not working the quads and hamstrings the way that we should do as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So it shows we've got a little opportunity. I don't know if we can see the difference on camera. I'd love to go back and get some side shots of your warmups, but there's a very significant difference side to side of your finished position right now. I know why strong men don't do it this way though. It's more work. <laughs> There's more work. Like you're you're doing iso tension as hard as you can at the top. I mean, I, I mean, it's activating those muscles. I was there, there'll be a little less of that as you get into owning that position where yeah. I'm 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 over coaching you on this driving through the floor port to get what I want to happen during the lift. You'll get to a point of yeah, you're just standing and it's hanging yeah. there. So, um, but some of that other tension too is in our head and neck relationship. So. So I'm gonna think about taking this right here. So not your, keep your head in this position, but right here at the base of the thoracic outlet. So right in here. Yeah. I want this to push back right there. There. 
right there, okay? Now, stand full strong, good. That's your, let this come away, good. Cue right there, good. Is that it? That's it. And now, on the setup, you're gonna get down, you're gonna be in that same position with the head and neck, and it never changes, and then when you get to the top, you'll be right here. A lot of people have a tendency to do that forward head roll because it'll start creating a little bit more tension through here. Yeah. But we're losing some opportunity in neurological output. So okay. this is right there. So it's not the right there. Good. Good. Right there. This is what I shoot for in the squat and deadlift. So if you either squat down or deadlift, you're going to be in this same position all the time in the finish. Wait, so you're in your finishing position in the start? Yeah. Okay. So you got to find what it feels like to be finished and then try to figure out a way to start that way. Yeah. Just have that in your mind. Right? Okay. So that's how we create this tie-in to here. Okay. So if we don't, we've got this like, you know, to squat, you'll see that when people miss, they miss at this uh, TL junction right here. So Let's right see. here, they'll fail right there. You'll see that in both the deadlift and the squat quite a bit. Yeah. People lose here because they don't have this where we're where we're the distal end of where we're exhibiting power tied into this very well so that's what the lab is is to be able to create that tension as a spinal stabilizer okay and that's one thing you're doing with actually really well in controlling that shoulder position so a lot of people just let that kind of yeah not be there and rolled out a little bit and then you'll have to well, let me do two different deadlifts here sure yeah Okay, I've seen that. Okay. And that is to pull everything up over the top of the hips. Yeah. Versus let's get this in our perfect position and own that position. Yeah. At the same finished position, what I want people to pay attention is how long the lift looks like it moves. Yeah. This is a big criticism that people have of me. Like they're like, you're short, you're 5'4, and your deadlifts are. Your deadlifts, uh, the bar is not even moving. Wait, someone said you're 5'4. There's like a You're not 5'4, though. You're actually, actually there was you're, a big, you're like 5'11. I know, but <laughs> and it looks like the bar doesn't move. Yeah. But it does, it just looks that way because there's no, there's a lack of energy leak. So, <laughs> so let's go side to side over here. Same finish position, but we'll look at the difference of how, how far it looks like the bar moves. So the difference, they look like the bar doesn't move as far. Yeah. It's the exact same thing. There's nothing that changes. The yeah. exact same finish position. The problem is I have to I have to recover position and get them back stacked over the top of the hips towards the end of the movement. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, this is incredible. There's just so many things. I mean, you, this is what you would expect from a guy that's done the feats of strength he has done on deadlift. So I hope you guys are enjoying this, but we're not done because, <laughs> because I'm having fun with this. We're gonna slap on some more weight and then we're just gonna kind of keep going. You feel that first one? You let it kind of get out in front of you just a little bit to really own, God damn it. own that position. The second one was a little better. Yeah. Um, but it, uh, it, let, oh, it, it took oh, you a little bit. A lot of times what I've found, and I think this is a common problem, and I've always had problems with this, no matter how much I try to think about it, my max, like I could sub-max very close to that weight for a high number of reps. It's like how come I can do, let's say 635 is my max right now, yeah. how come I can do 615 for three or four in 635 just one time. And it's because the the repping it, the second, third, and fourth rep, I'm in a different position. Yes. And so the think about this one. This is a common one probably. It, it is common. Yeah. And um, so that is something that you can learn yeah. to use. So be slow on your eccentric uh -huh. and really feel and own that position that you're in in the second one. Okay, and that bar position, that hip position, all those things are now exactly where they should be. So go down slow and let that weight just hover over the ground and get that captured in your mental, you know, awareness of your body position. Uh -huh. And then on your first one, you need to be patient. You need 
that bar, you're going down to pull it and it's heavy, it's in your mind, it's in your heavy, it's in your hands, it's heavy. And it makes you want to jump the gun, pull that trigger just a little yeah. too soon. Exactly so we have to like be me. patient, just wait for it until you're in this position. It's like all the way, boom, there you go. So I got a story to tell you. Sure, yeah. It's about the day I learned to deadlift. Is there a day for that? There is a day. Yeah. There's a, there's a moment in time. Okay, okay. So three weeks before this meet, I tweak my back really bad. Like I have to like roll to get out of bed. Oh, shit. Okay. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna do this meet, okay? Uh -huh. And so I get my squat in, did like eight something, get my bench in, arching during the bench, really kind of brought it back. I was doing better, but mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God. So I'm in the warm up room and I miss 585. For your deadlift? For my deadlift. And you were, what was your opener at the beat gonna be? 650. Okay. Well, that's a, that's, that's it. Mess and this was, gonna be, this was gonna be the first meet I was gonna find there. I've been like hovering on like 700 pound deadlift for ages. Yeah. It, for meat deadlift. Well, this is and a long I'm time like, ago. Yeah, this is a long time ago. <laughs> I'm like, people are like, what are you gonna do? And I'm like, I, I'm gonna go out and, and hit it. They're gonna need to drop your opener. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm gonna get in the perfect position. I'm just gonna get there. And so I, I forced myself. I knew I was in. I would not be able to lift the weight if I just didn't have. And I just sat there and I pulled tension. I got and I just waited and waited and waited until it was like too late. And I'm like, there it is. Really? Boom. Went up like nothing. Does that work for conventional too? Same concept, the wedging concept. Yeah. You know, you know uh, I haven't pulled as much, so you know, my best for sumo is a thousand pounds. Yeah. Thousand and one or two, whatever it was, uh, for sure. For two reps. <laughs> uh, and my best conventional is 905. But mm -hmm. I, don't, I, haven't, I don't do a lot of conventional training. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it could be higher. Anyway, so 650 goes up. Yeah. And I'm like, that felt good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit my 700 next. What, on the day you hurt your back? Your back yeah. was hurting? So After you it, didn't, it didn't hurt. The 650 felt per no pain whatsoever in my back. You just waited to get I just position. waited. I, it was, I knew I had to. I was like, it forced me not to jump that gun when I had all that tension in my head. I'm like, it's ready. I wanna pull. Like, I'm scared. And then it's like, I know I can't, I'm gonna fail. I'm just like, wait, boom, boom, and there it was. I'm like, 700, I hit it. 749, let's do it. Really? I hit it. Fourth attempt, 801. I mean, this isn't, this is like a ghost story kind of. I don't know, hey, I mean, I'm getting it's just as buried, it's right there, it's fucking right there. Put the flashlight boom, boom, boom. Lock it out. You're 801, 198, nailed it. I never did had a, I never had a 700 comp deadlift yeah. as a peak. I went from, from, from the sixes to 801 because it forced me. I had nothing to do except for get in that perfect position. That was the day I learned to deadlift. Oh God, that's crazy. Okay, let me try to, let me try to, <laughs> maybe, maybe, today's, maybe today's the day for me. Do exactly what you've been doing. All right. Okay. But I just want you to wait a second before you pull. create so much tension. Just get in position. All right. And we're not even going to worry about it. What I want you to do is I want you to break this bar out of position, off the floor, just by wedging and get there. More, 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 more. There. Good. Easier when you don't spend as much time down there. What'd you say? When you don't spend like two like two minutes down there. Yeah. Yeah. So that obviously takes a fatigue on you, but yeah. learning to get in and own that just a little bit more. Just a little there it is. Yeah. Get that spinal uprighting. Get that fill. Get in position. Not extension. Right. Stack. Tight to the core. Boom. Wow. Just wait for it. Okay. Break that bar in your setup. You just rip it off. There you go. Do a little bit more here. Like loops. You will. Yeah. You will. Yeah. Huh. And that second one, you really nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. 
that first one it made the bar whip or a little bit caught you caught yeah. you there so it was a little opportunity so it's showing you there's a little bit of that energy leak yeah but getting back on it and then drive wedge through push the floor away push the floor. so a lot of people will think about trying to get on their heels yeah and we don't want to do that well, we're actually the whole midfoot that plant we're going to drive the push the floor away so wedge in so this is the next step you're going to get this super tight wedge yeah. Get it freaking just hover in the ground and then push the floor away with explosive power. Okay. Think about leg pressing the floor away. Just push, boom, all the way through that lockout. Tight, wait for it, wait for it. Push. Was that it? That's a little, little, little bit more than that to the front of the foot on that one. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Mid foot. More wedge, more push, less wedge. Okay. It's gonna, if you shove that through, there's nothing for your butt. Like this is, you're gonna drive this up, not lift it up. Okay. So we gotta change that perspective mentally because that's automatically gonna get you doing this, right? Yeah. And what we wanna do is have this solid, and this isn't doing any work, it's boom! It's that. Yeah. That's it, okay, put a circle on the screen. <laughs> Dead. Are you, are you feeling it? Well, when you start feeling it in your groin and stuff, also, uh, <laughs> not in a bad way, it's like, oh, I'm going to pull my groin, I'm like, actually, like, that, but also I'm kind of like, you guys know I'm preparing for a bodybuilding competition while I'm deadlifting, well, I still have a goal to deadlift over 700 pounds, that's downstream, things move and kind of come and go throughout my periodization schedule, so this is still important to me, you know what I mean? And this is actually priming me for the hamstring workout we're gonna be doing. Exactly. Yeah. So we're getting a lot better activation yeah. of all the muscles, great amount of tension in the system that's gonna help improve your setup and your deadlift long term. Yeah. But also again, we're gonna help with the bodybuilding uh, perspective of that because you're getting a lot better movement patterns in general and engagement of the muscles. So yeah. I'm really happy okay. with the finish position and the setup tension that you're bringing to this. So now you want me to just do some deadlifts, right? Do some deadlifts. We're just not going to overthink it. Just right. like. I like what I'm seeing. Yeah, I'm having to consciously like really tighten up at the top, you know what I mean? Yep. And that's still trying to keep my shoulders down. I mean, and that'll, that level of consciousness won't have to be, like we're trying to fix that little bit of pattern, that unhinge that you have, because that's where we weren't getting the engagement. So yeah, um, so yeah you won't have to at the top go, oh, I gotta flex, is yeah. when you really get those patterns down. Uh -huh. But everything is happening the way that we want to have it to happen during the lift. I'm, I'm really pleased with what we're seeing. All right, well, thank you so much for I'm glad we had enough whiteboard for you, actually. <laughs> I was a little concerned that we're going to have to flip it around and, and show you the, the dirty stuff I have drawn on the other sides of the whiteboards, but we didn't have to do that. We, oh, let's see that. No, no, no. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much, Chris, for helping my deadlift. Where can we find more information about deadlift coaching from you? Yeah, so we have a lot of resources. So um, we provide free resources okay. nearly every day on our YouTube and the Kabuki underscore virtual coaching Instagram accounts. So we drop free videos, our coaching team does that. Um, or you can go to uh, Kabuki virtual coaching mm -hmm. uh, and we've got like uh, online coaching options. We have a movement library, so a real e economical approach. It's all indexed, <laughs> hundreds, probably a thousand videos on there. A lot of stuff that's not out there on the free platform, but also indexed. So you can go, I wanna know about foot health. I wanna know about different areas of what's going on in the body guided tutorials yeah. and all that's like $11 a month or something. So, oh, and sweet. that can work. Hey, if you're working with Juji's programs, you know, this is a great adjunct right to that. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of different uh, options, whatever fits your needs. Yeah. I do a few go. things on my channel. You can check out me, Chris <laughs> Duffin. It's like muffin, but with a D. Okay. You <laughs> yeah. type that into social media, I'll pop up. You type it into the internet, I'll pop up. And um, the mad scientist on Instagram. Yeah, that's right. Mad scientist Duffin. So, yeah, you guys, thank you so much for watching, and let us know what you think below.